Hello, everyone. I am Kimberly Adams. Welcome back to Make Me Smart, where we make today make sense. It's Friday, June the 23rd. Kai is out today, but joining me is the marketplace's Megan McCarty Carino. Welcome back, Always elegant. Yeah, no, it's always (laughs) fun to join you guys for uh, Economics on Tap on Friday. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. I'm so glad you're here because I want to hear all about your drink. We've got the YouTube live stream up and running. We've got the drinks, as per mentioned. We've got the Discord. We've got the YouTube chat going. And uh, yeah, Megan, what are you drinking? All right. I've been holding mine in reserve before I do the reveal. Look at the garnish. Right? So it's very pretty looking. It's a, uh, it's sort of a, Koki Americano spritz. Um, it's kind of on the, you know, I was looking for a spritz type aperitif drink, kind of a low alcohol f- situation. Um, I thought it would be probably in my best interest for, for today. <laughs> it's um, it's kind of like a white Negroni, the, the mm. basics of a white Negroni, but without the gin and with a uh, spritzer and some lemon twist. Yeah. Wow, impression. that's so pretty. Hold it up a little bit higher. It's lovely. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank I, you. I love that you brought the cocktail game today when I brought <laughs> wine. No, but I mean, I knew I had to come strong. Week, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, because I'm the cocktail person. But because it's been a hard week, week since I knew I was going to do wine, I at least decided to do my goblet, my dragon oh, goblet, which oh my I God, love. Amazing. <laughs> yes. Because if you're going to be basic, be basic with the dragon. <sighs> Anyway, Mm. let's see. Margie wanted me to mention what she is drinking, which is hard juice, passion fruit, lime flavor. Margie Kitch. Okay, got that. Um, Let's see. We've got Tim has a Carback Hopadillo Hazy IPA over in the Discord. We've got Vian has a Vampire Walrus Imperial IPA. I love that when Kai's not here, all the IPAs come through. Come to represent. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Kay got a smoker, Kay Gilbert. So she got a smoker and smoked a Sky Kraken Hazy IPA. And (laughs) yes, I heard the fact that you challenged Kai to try it. So uh, hopefully we will see Kai smoking his drink soon. Uh, Wait, is he gonna see. smoke his beer? I know uh, that was the that was the challenge. So yeah. Kay basically challenged Kai to smoke a beer. We will see how that goes. Interesting. And let's see. Uh, Richard, heading from good old St. Louis to Ruston, Louisiana, is having a Heineken. Uh, ooh, <laughs> Skeeter Magoo, peanut butter on a crunchy on a little spoon. Uh, I love all <laughs> I of these love things. That. Yes um and oh matthew drinking room temperature coffee from a mug left this morning because it's been a day matthew i feel you we are yes. here with you in spirit i i hope that is you the vibe the rest of the day yeah but it's friday it so. is the vibe speaking <laughs> of the vibe what is your news megan all right so i was taking a look at this uh nugget demographic nugget that circulated late yesterday. And Mm -hmm. that is that the median age in the United States, not a surprise, has reached a record high. Uh, Median age is now 38.9 years. So Kimberly, you and I are like right in there. We're both older. (laughs) We're like slightly. No, no, no. I'm older than you. We're slightly, <laughs> okay. we're slightly older than average, but we're pretty, you know, we're pretty we're medium, right there. I guess. Yeah, we're so, right so in there. You, so we really are basic. We're like default, <laughs> like definition average. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. All right. But, I'll sit with um, that for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So, of course, you know, this is not a surprise to anyone who who studies demographics. We have been knowing that the baby boomer generation, which was quite large as it ages, kind of shifts the, the demographics in that direction. But it's kind of moved more quickly than I think, you know, people had anticipated because of some other factors that have been going on. So in 2000, the median age was 35. Uh, In 1980, the median age was 30. So we're like, we're moving fast. The the median age is moving up quite a pace. And there are a few factors that are at play here. Um, 
the fertility rate has slowed. Mm -hmm. People are having fewer children um, and children at, at later ages. So, you know, that's kind of pushing things, pushing the age up. Um, we have had less immigration uh, has been down mm. over the last decade, and it has recovered a bit since kind of the, the very, very, very lows of the pandemic, um, but still generally slower than a decade before. Um, we are still younger median age <laughs> than in many countries in Europe, which mm -hmm. I think is an interesting point to look at when we think about um, the drop in fertility where, you know, I think a lot of times I covered, you know, uh, the workplace and a lot of family policies and how those have impacted families over, you know, the, the last several years and in general in the US that we just, we don't have a lot of friendly fam uh, family friendly policies at baseline in the US. Uh, uh -huh. Childcare is Completely very expensive, <laughs> um, you know, like, rent and housing is very, very expensive. So we have a lot of people putting off having children uh, for a long time, putting off milestones, like getting married and these kinds of things, um, in part due to some of the, the economic trends that we have seen over recent decades. But the interesting thing when you look at Europe is that some mm -hmm. of the countries that do have some of the more family supportive policies, uh, you know, countries in Scandinavia, also have older populations. So it's kind of not mm -hmm. following that that is like the one answer to the issue. And I mean, we I bring this up because it has enormous implications for society, for the economy, the fact that the population is getting older. You know, I'm not saying like this is a problem because it's just a problem for a population to be older like there are economic implications that we talk about on marketplace all the time having to do with um having a smaller workforce you know workforce participation yeah. that's something we always look at when the employment reports come out uh our workforce participation labor force participation is naturally lower than it was before the yeah. population aged and so much of the the losses that we've had since pre-pandemic are in those older age groups uh you know because people have aged out of the workforce or people are not um working to the same extent that they were in those age groups uh, but largely because people have yeah. just aged out of the workforce and so that affects the tax base it affects our productivity as a country our economic productivity it's kind of a mm -hmm. big deal you know and it's so hard to talk about this without making it sound like we're you're engaging right. in generational warfare Absolutely. because like i've I, I bring up these these trends and and even when i was in seattle a couple of weeks ago i was bringing this up in front of a group of people at the member station someone's like oh but yeah. you know older people being the majority is not a bad thing right. because you know they contribute so much wisdom i'm like i'm not saying that's not right. true yeah. but you also cannot ignore the fact that most millennials do not believe that social security is really going to be there for us. Housing is unaffordable. There are not enough people in the workforce to take care of older Americans right. as they age. There are simply not enough people. There is not enough housing. Child care yeah. is unaffordable. And so mm -hmm. we have this growing economic problem that it's hard to talk about it because it makes it sound like totally. you're bashing boomers and and, me, yeah. and the okay boomer trend did not help with that. Yeah, um, not but, the best. There Framing. are real economic trends that are at play that if we keep ignoring them and not talking about yeah. them, it's going to hit us like a tsunami, even though it kind of already is. Right. Um, and I will point out, I said earlier that we are average, but we're not. As you said, we're the median. And Deborah exactly. Fight pointed out, average is not median. Take Point taken. All right, okay. what's your other news? Well... I just felt the need because it's Friday oh and why not? We're having some drinks to just bring up mm. the fact that this week has felt like a cage match and some of our luminaries from the tech world may be having a cage match. I don't know if you've been following this little fun little story, but it just I've feels been very trying to ignore it. Actually, right? <laughs> I know. Because it's so, it's, it just epitomizes, I feel like, the world that we live in, that the two, you know, titans of social media have, have 
challenge it's each like other. It's like Revenge of the Nerds with billions of dollars <sighs> behind it. It's really dispiriting. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. So if you, you know, on the off chance that you've been under a rock and are not familiar, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk have challenged each other to a cage match, and it may or may not be happening in Vegas. Uh, <laughs> like it, I, I think it might actually happen, just given the uh, the facts on the ground here and uh, the kind of level of maturity and the social I media. I think that <laughs> after this week in particular, the sort of billionaires doing reckless things with their money would be less enticing right but apparently not so i don't know i got nothing to say it's been a weird week hasn't it though all right okay well Well, mine is back to uh, the news real news yes mine is very washington based well actually no it's not it's nationwide based so supreme court news this week um the supreme court knocked down a challenge by texas and louisiana to biden administration immigration rules basically the biden administration was doing what most presidential administrations do, which is to decide that since there were so many people crossing the border illegally, they were going to prioritize deporting people who were involved in terrorism, who were involved in other crimes, who were, you know, just doing stuff that we really are worried about and not necessarily focus on tracking down and deporting people who are just here, keeping their heads down, trying to work, make a living for their families, right? Texas and Louisiana said that the U.S. government basically shouldn't be able to make that decision. They should be going after everybody. And the Supreme Court said that Texas and Louisiana did not have the standing. If people want to look it up, there's a link in the show notes to um, Amy Howe's wonderful blog that always gets into this stuff. And this case is called United States versus Texas. And the so i'm going to read from this texas and louisiana went to federal court in texas to challenge the policy the u.s district judge agreed the policy violates federal federal law and vacated it nationwide the biden administration then came to the supreme court which agreed to take up the case without waiting for the federal appeals court to weigh in but left the ruling striking down the policy policy in place Okay, so in the end, the justices reached only the first question, because there were two questions, whether Texas and Louisiana had standing to bring the lawsuit, and they said no for a bunch of reasons that I'll let y'all get into later. But what they didn't do was get into whether or not the policy was unconstitutional. And we've been seeing a lot of this with the Supreme Mm -hmm. Court, where they're ruling on these very narrowed things that make them not take up the rest of the case to kind of punt things back to Congress or punt things down the road for a later case where even if the court, and I'm talking about the supermajority of the court, even if the supermajority of the court would like to lean in a certain direction, they seem to be kind of waiting on cases that are rock solid Mm -hmm. that will allow them to rule in one direction or another. These cases that have standing problems, these cases that have technicalities, like you said, Megan, on the issues, they're just like, we're going to rule on the technicality and not deal with the rest of it. We are still waiting on the student loan case, which is also another question of standing and Mm -hmm. policy and it'll be very interesting to see if they rule on the standing whether or not these states and i think it's two students who've um filed this case these cases whether the states and the students have standing versus whether the policy is a problem so This is all very interesting, particularly from Mm -hmm. the nuances, because nerd, I'm interested. And so please read Amy Howe's work on this and pay attention to what's going on in the Supreme Court. It matters for all of us. Yeah. Very different uh, feeling this summer in the rulings that we're talking about here compared to a year ago where we did have this blockbuster reversal of precedent. And I wonder if the two and are very broad related. that's a very yeah. good point that's an excellent point because you had a super um broad ruling that they said was very narrow because right. if you looked at the um what do you call them the um 
the writings up on there's too much wine mm. i can't even remember when you look at the decision yeah uh, they said that they were ruling on a very narrow basis right. but it had wide-reaching effects here they're mm-hmm. ruling on the technicalities to avoid these wide-reaching decisions anywho yeah. we can go on for this forever all right um let's go ahead and uh play some games shall okay. we All right, so now it's time for our game, Half Full, Half Empty, hosted by Drew Jostad. He's going to give us some topics from this week's news, and we'll let you know how we are feeling about them. Half full being more positive and half empty being more negative. Take it away, Drew. All right, from Carhartt beanies down to Timberland boots, are you half full or half empty on workwear becoming fashionable? Hmm. Megan, what about you? Hmm. I'm half full on the fashion for sure. Um, I like Carhartt products. I like to pick pick some up when I'm, you know, shopping for my faucets and whatnot at Ace Hardware. But uh, I don't know. Maybe there's maybe there's some negatives for people who actually need to wear those clothing for their work in the form of, you know, inflation with increased demand. So, I mean, I'm still gonna stick with half full those are you know hardy products they're well-made products and i think they should be fashionable yeah cindy from uh cindy from texas in the discord was making the same point as you as long as the workwear doesn't get more expensive look i'm all for people getting like you said clothes that last for a while from a sustainability perspective so i'm going to go mm-hmm. half full this is yeah. um christian schwab's story from earlier this week you should go back and listen to it it was super fun um but this idea that sort of the hipsters are taking over these these ideas we've been doing this ever since timberlands you know became yeah. popular and remember <laughs> never forget beyonce in her timberland timberland heels uh that were so amazing but um look office workers who had the opportunity to work remotely during the pandemic got to move into sweats and be comfy and i don't think people are ever going back and since we still can't quite wear sweats to work i think people are going to the next (laughs) stage speak for yourself (laughs) okay i still live in washington dc i think la is a different vibe we are i can't really move yeah, I can't really move through DC. Maybe in, fancy in sweats. sweats on the street. No, yeah, no leggings, perhaps, perhaps. We do the athleisure. No. Yeah, no, no. Washington still isn't there. But anyway, <laughs> I'm half full. What's the next one, Drew? All right. All right. This year's Wimbledon tennis tournament will feature AI-generated commentary and captions on its website and app. Are you half full or half empty? Oh gosh. Half empty. Um, yeah. A, I want the well-trained interpreters who are doing American Sign Language to be making their money and remaining in their jobs. Um, but also, um, it's still so not necessarily accurate uh, at this point that I don't trust it. <laughs> Half empty. Yeah. Um, I, I feel... <laughs> Uh, like, I don't want to reveal too much here, but just because I cover AI so, so often, but because you're hosting I Marketplace Tech, half empty on this kind of use case. Uh, yeah, for many of the same reasons, you know, like, is it better than what a human offers in any way other than like saving money? Um, and is that what we're, you know, every single like uh equation is is just going to boil down to like there are things why do we need ai to do that like is it better in a way i think is a question to to always ask every time we're like ai could do that but like is it actually better and i think in many cases with large language models and you know with generating commentary of these nature it's often not better than what a highly skilled person would do, Uh, which I'm assuming, yeah, at Wimbledon, that's the top of the top. So like, well, and and particularly in high profile events like this, when you can afford it and you can get it, use it, right? Use people, 
that are the best at it. I get if maybe you have a smaller event and a smaller budget and Mm -hmm. you want to provide some level of accessibility that you would not Mm -hmm. otherwise be able to provide. Sure, use AI and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of like that's your... It, it's creating an opportunity for more accessibility where previously there would have been none versus right. downgrading accessibility mm-hmm. in a place where there previously was. Mm-hmm. That's my take. Yeah. All right, Drew, what's next? All right. Are you half full or half empty on a product from a French firm that is a talking credit card mm-hmm. for use by blind and visually impaired consumers? You're the tech person, Megan, you go first. Um, yeah, I have to say when I heard of this, which we uh, we we ran a story on the show about this uh, credit card in France, when I initially heard about it, it sounded like a privacy nightmare, right? I mean, a talking mm. credit card that sort of reads out your transactions in public, but the uh, uh, you know, <laughs> the kind of reason for it and and the problem that it solves is actually a good thing i guess uh you know there is a fair amount of fraud that happens with um visually impaired people shopping and and having like the amounts uh transacted changed or altered in Mm -hmm. some way um and so what the talking credit card can do is you know provide some some feedback to make sure that people are not getting ripped off um it is it is a little weird. I will give it that, but I'm going to say half full on this. I'm sorry. I wasn't chuckling at what you were saying. <laughs> L and S Roy span in the chat on YouTube was uh, mimicking what the card might say. And it was quote, yeah. are you sure you can afford that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, maybe um, that would we- definitely be a good thing for it to say to me. <laughs> But. It's like I saw a TikTok the other day where uh, somebody was trying to order something on Amazon, and I guess that uh, Amazon has integrated some sort of AI, and they were like, people like you usually order a size up, <laughs> and they were really upset. Mm. Um, so rude. I am going to say half full on this accessibility feature for the visually impaired Um, I think what we've learned from most accessibility features in tech is that it tends to create opportunities that we didn't even expect, like Mm -hmm. curb cuts for people who are physically disabled have made life a lot easier for parents with strollers or people who are elderly with mobility issues. So I'm going to go half full. All right, Drew, what's next? We got a poll on the last one. Yes, let's do the poll. All right, those of you who are watching us live on YouTube, which I hope everybody is because it's the best way to watch the show, uh, you are going to have the opportunity to weigh in on our poll. So, Drew, take it away. Are you half full or half empty on brain implants? So we have to vamp for a minute, Megan. Don't answer because we have to let people weigh in without our influence. So you've been covering this as well on tech. So do you want to talk about the issue generally? Right. So we we covered this recently because Neuralink, the uh, brain implant company founded by Elon Musk, recently got FDA clearance to begin human trials on their brain implants. This has been kind of a field that has been rapidly developing. There are a few front runners, incidentally, most of them are in based in Austin, Texas. Um, there's another uh, another company that has also been cleared for human trials and is now uh, doing you know raising funds uh, to to start those human trials. Um, uh, I think a, a like there have been there have been human trials um, and some complications have have come up in those which will. We'll get into once the uh, (laughs) once we have. Can you talk a little bit about why, uh, at least what the use case is? What they do, yeah, as it's been promoted. Right. Well, the interesting thing is uh, actually like Neuralink has proposed some different types of use cases, but the you know the most intuitive one is that for people who have uh, mobility issues, um, you know that it could read brain impulses and um, and use that to control machines, you know, um, or computers. And so 
very, very helpful for people with disabilities, you know, that make it difficult to, to do things physically on a computer or, you know, um, to, to operate uh, prostheses or, and things like that, that you could actually do it with your brain impulse with a brain implant that mm -hmm. you could control those things. Um, Neuralink awesome. has also proposed sort of, you know, using this as to augment human capabilities in general. Like we would be, you know, if, like mm. people could be constantly, so. yeah, connected, Upgrading, their brains yeah. connected to the matrix or whatever, which is disconcerting. <clears throat> I mean, I was... Look, I'm not gonna lie. When I saw that scene where they downloaded judo into Keanu Reeves' brain, I was like, "That I would, I would not say no to that." Um, but anyway, no, yeah. it wasn't judo. It was jujitsu. That's mm. right. Um, but anyway, all right. So let's close the poll. We've got 136 votes, which is not yeah. the best turnout, but I will take it. Okay. And let's see how we ended up. Drum roll, please. <laughs> do do. Okay. Half empty, 63%. Half full, Ooh. 36%. Wow. Um, hmm, Man, our interesting. audience are oh. skeptics. <laughs> Everybody was telling me it was kung fu, not even jujitsu mm. or judo. I know nothing about the Matrix, clearly. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to go um, half empty on this because at this point, I trust nothing that Elon Musk does. Well, I, I think that's the key point to me is that being, I think in the in the realm of, you know, academic research or, you know, maybe even- I'm sorry, you know, I have like, to stop you, Megan. Somebody in the chat said, if I had a brain implant, I it would have remembered that for me about the matrix. <laughs> I mean, that's one thing, you know, I would definitely be <laughs> a lot better on these shows if I could Fair. just download- okay. Right. I know the news. Um, go ahead. But yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to go with half empty as well just because of the like economic incentive um complications that come with it becoming a giant business for profit business uh and you know all of the complications that that come about in in the tech world with wanting to make things that don't have a lot of negative externalities. So uh, I would say the track record has been poor on that front. So um, in the YouTube chat, JC Katz 411 asks a really good question. Mm -hmm. Ask the question of whether or not we'd be half full or half empty without Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. It raises a good point because we're on the way to this anyway. So if you're talking about the technology of brain right. implants for the purpose, again, of accessibility and for yeah. helping people have more ability to move through the world in a way that feels comfortable to them, I'm going to go half full. Yeah. In this particular environment, in this particular company, half empty. So, I mean, I guess like that. the fact that Elon Musk is helming it and put, you know, a lot of his uh money into it has sort of spurred the race it has really spurred things along just in general in the industry i think probably a lot of people would say has had a very galvanizing and positive effect on the industry interest in it investment in it in general that will probably have a lot of positive effects in what we're talking about so i guess we'll find out pretty soon we'll find out all right Thank you so much, Drew. That is it for us today. Kai and I will be back on Monday. Until then, as you know, we're switching up the show a little bit, trying out some new segments. So if you have an idea for a segment or something you'd like to see us do on the show, please let us know, even if it's a game or whatever. We're at 508 you Be Smart and at makemesmart at marketplace.org. You gotta do the dance, Megan. <laughs> What's the dance? They didn't tell me there was going to be a dance. I only brought a cocktail that wasn't big enough for dancing. <laughs> Make Me Smart is produced by Courtney Bergseeker. Today's episode was engineered by Charlton Thorpe. Drew Jostad wrote the theme music for our Friday game. And our intern is Neelafar Shabandi. 
The team behind our Friday game is Emily McCune and Antoinette Brock. And Marissa Cabrera is our senior producer. Bridget Bodner is the director of podcasts. And Francesca Levy is the executive director of digital and on demand. It's in the script this time, I swear. Ha, ha, ha.